Hi, it's Susan Kellner of the Ontario Pesticide Education Program and I'm going to go through Chapter 7 of the Grower Pesticide Safety Course Manual. Chapter 7 is Pesticides and the Environment. There are 23 slides in this presentation and it will take me uh, about 15 minutes to review with you. By the end of this lesson, you should be ready to identify and explain the four factors that determine environmental risk. Describe processes that affect the fate of pesticides in the environment. Describe actions you can take to prevent pesticide contamination of air, water, and soil. Describe actions you can take to protect bees from pesticide poisoning. Protect air, water, and soil. How you use pesticides can affect the environment. Follow the labels environmental precautions not sections on the label. The label will state ways that pesticide is harmful to the environment and then give you directions on how to prevent harm. Directions could include such things as leave a one meter buffer zone between the treated area and water and don't apply to areas with steep slopes and don't apply next to areas when bees are present. Those things will be on a label. Now, environmental risk factors can be shown in this way. Um, the degree of risk will depend on four risk factors. So how persistent is that pesticide? Number two, mobility. What's its ability to move around in the environment? Three, non-target toxicity. So non-target you uh, may be uh, having a toxicity against something you don't intend to uh, use that pesticide on. So a non-target um, insect or plant. And number four, the volume of use. So the more we use something, the more that gets out in the environment, of course, um, the higher the environmental risk. So we have the environmental risk factors. Persistence, how long does it remain in the environment, right? So examples are DDT, picloram, atrazine. Mobility, how easily does the pesticide move away from the site through air, water, and soil. Non-target toxicity, how toxic is the pesticide to species that are not pests. Volume of use, how much of the pesticide is being used. And environmental risk equals persistence times mobility times non-target toxicity times volume of use. So as with that equation, lower any one of these factors and the risk is lower. Let's talk about environment uh, with pesticide fate. What happens to a pesticide after it is applied? Well, a pesticide properties influence its fate how it will react in air, water, sunlight, and soil, and how it reacts with the microorganisms of plants or animals. Right, so we have um, physical properties, uh, chemical properties, so we have degradation, bioaccumulation, biomagnification, adsorption, absorption, and volatility. And we also have natural processes that are happening out there, so um, drift, surface runoff, leaching, and soil erosion. So we'll, we'll address all those in the coming slides. Degradation, a breakdown of pesticides, usually into simpler and less toxic products. So pesticides can be broken down through three processes, microbial degradation, chemical degradation, and photo degradation. Microbial degradation, that's microorganisms use the pesticide as food, Chemical degradation, the chemical reactions break down the pesticide, and photodegradation, the sunlight breaks down the pesticide. The rate of breakdown is measured by half-life. DDT and picloram are persistent and have half-lives longer than a year. 2,4-D and atrazine are moderately persistent with no half-lives, with half-lives of two to three weeks. Bioaccumulation. Some pesticides have the ability to build up in the fatty tissues of animals and these pesticides continue to build up with each exposure and as they accumulate, the pesticides become increasingly harmful to health. Biomagnification, 
This is the ability of some pesticides to build up in the food chain. So toxaphene is an insecticide that is extremely persistent and it bioaccumulates in fish and it was removed from use in Canada in 1974. Adsorption. This is the binding of pesticides to soil particles and other matter, similar to paper clips sticking to a magnet. Absorption is the movement of pesticides into plants, animals, or structures such as soil and wood, and that would be similar to water being absorbed by a sponge. Volatility. Pesticides change from liquids or solids into vapors when exposed to moisture, heat, and air. Volatility increases when temperatures are high and droplets are small. For example, 2,4-D and dicamba will injure sensitive crops. Choose a low volatile product. Now, dicamba products have been reformulated to reduce their volatilization. In 1967, dicamba was sold as DMA salt, Banville. Then in 1983, Banville was sold as a DGA. So that was a less volatile formulation and that was sold as Banville II. And in 2017, Dicamba is sold as Extendamax with Vapor Grip, DGA Salt with Encapsulation, and Ingenia, a BAPMA salt to reduce volatility. So the formulations over the years have improved and trying to reduce the volatilization to avoid injuring sensitive crops when we're using that product. And if you are spraying 2,4-DR dicamba next to sensitive crops, do your best. Minimize that drift. These crops that are sensitive to 2,4-D and dicamba, um, most sensitive grapes, sweet potato, tobacco, pepper, tomato, watermelon. Also, cantaloupe, cucumber, peach, peanut, squash, broccoli, cabbage, kale, mustard, and turnip. How do pesticides move with wind and water then? Well, we have drift, and we've talked about vapor drift a little bit there, surface runoff, leaching, and soil erosion, and let's talk about each of those. We'll start with drift. Vapor drift occurs when the wind moves pesticide vapors from the site of application, and spray drift occurs when the mo wind moves spray droplets from the site of application, also called particle drift. And we'll talk about that uh, in chapter 18. We have a whole chapter on drift of pesticides. Surface runoff. Pesticides move with water over the surface. Pesticides move with water when they dissolve in water, are soluble or bind, adsorb to soil particles that move in the water through soil erosion. Factors that affect runoff. Slope of the land, soil type and texture, moisture content of the soil, crop residues on the soil surface, and rains or irrigation that might happen after an application. So I think we can realize how each of those five factors might affect the surface runoff. We want to reduce surface runoff so we can affect some of those factors. We can maintain a vegetative filter strip along waterways. We talked a little bit about that under chapter three, the label. Watch the weather. You don't want to apply pesticide as rain is expected. Don't irrigate immediately after a pesticide application. Use adjuvants to stick the pesticide to plant surfaces and use no-till or minimum tillage to reduce soil erosion. Leaching. Leaching occurs when pesticides that are dissolved in water move through the soil. Movement may be downward, upward, or side to side. Pesticides may move into groundwater or to tile drains. Pesticides are more likely to leach through soils that are sandy or have a low water holding capacity or two, when pesticides are persistent or soluble in water. Take actions to protect water. Ontario laws, and there are two laws, never use anti back flow Oh, always use an anti-backflow device when you fill your equipment. Never wash equipment near surface water, ponds, streams, or creeks. Source protection plans. 
Ontario has 22 source protection plans. The plans have actions you must take to protect municipal drinking water. You may need to use specific buffer zones in addition to those on a pesticide label or store and mix pesticides at a specific distance from a well or drinking water intake. And your municipality will have this information. Search the interactive source water protection map online to find out information for your area. Protect bees. Do not apply pesticides when fruit trees are in bloom. Follow label directions to protect bees. Apply pesticides after 8 p.m. when bees are not active. Tell neighboring beekeepers when you plan to apply pesticides or when you plan to plant treated seeds. Reduce risk to the pollinators when you're using treated seed. Now in the springs of 2012 and 2013, PMRA received an unusually high number of incidence reports of bees losses in Ontario. The insecticide clothiandin from the neonicotinoid family was found in 70% of dead bee samples. Now the neonic active ingredients, the midacloprid, thymethoxan, and clothianandin are in products used to treat corn and soybean seed. So examples of these seed treatment products are ponchos, you might be familiar with, the Cruiser, Stress Shield, Aceleron, and Cruiser Max Bean seed treatment. So those are some of the products. So we want to reduce risk to pollinators from treated seed. Now bees have died after being exposed to these insecticide contaminated dust generated when you're planting treated corn seed or soybean seed, let this local beekeepers know when you plan to plant insecticide treated seed. Plant in the early morning or evening, avoid those strong winds that could carry dust from the field. Control flowering weeds and plants growing in and around fields so that bees are not attracted to the area. Use a dust reducing fluid seed agent with that seed and adjust your planter to reduced dust. Mount air intakes for the vacuum meters up high so that field dust does not enter the planter. Here's a learning activity for you to complete this section. I have a piece of paper and on that piece of paper list down some concerns about environmental risks that you might have for your farm and also find, think about the steps you could take and put into action on your farm to minimize the risks. And that's an overview of chapter 7.